Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2012 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Miss Rianne Russell. Rianne is a conservation technician here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Rianne grew up in Devon, England. After seeing Jurassic Park at the age of seven, Rianne decided that she wanted to become a paleontologist. So at the age of 18, she moved to Alberta to study paleontology. After obtaining her bachelor's degree in biological sciences from the University of Alberta, Rianne came to work at the Royal Tyrrell Museum as a summer preparation technician. At the end of that summer, she was offered a position as a conservation technician, which meant that she would now focus on repairing and conserving fossils already present in the collections, rather than preparing the newly collected specimens. Rianne is also currently en enrolled at the, in the University of Victoria's Diploma in Cultural Resource Management, a program in which she learns skills related to museum studies and collections care that can be applied in her daily work. Today, Rianne will be presenting the results of an ongoing investigation on the types of damage fossils endure during their lifespan on the museum shelves and the best methods to repair them. What most people don't realize is that even after a fossil has been collected and been stored on the shelf, it can still slowly degenerate over time and disintegrate into powder if it hasn't been treated appropriately. And even the best prepared fossils can be accidentally damaged when they are moved on display or handled by one of those <clears throat> clumsy researchers. <laughs> Consequently, a conservation technician's job is never done. So without further delay, I present you Miss Rianne Russell. <laughs> Hello everybody, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, so my talk today is going to be about paleontological conservation, or paleoconservation for short, it's much easier to say, uh, and how this really is still uh, an emerging field, it's something that's still very much catching on. So just a quick outline of what I'm going to cover today. Uh, first of all, why do we want to conserve paleontological collections? What affects them? So what kind of things are going to cause them to deteriorate over time? Uh, and these are called agents of deterioration. Uh, how can we care for them? So this is a sort of preventive measures you can take, uh, things you can do to avoid them breaking in the first place. Uh, how do we preserve them? Uh, this is interventive measures, um, specifically adhesives I'm going to focus on today. There's lots I could talk about, but uh, my research is specifically about adhesives. And this is the kind of thing you can do uh, when damage does occur and you have to do something about it. And that's going to lead into the research that I've been doing uh, with Brandon Strelitzky, our collections manager, um, about tensile testing of adhesives here at the museum. So I just want to start with a few definitions of some of the things we're going to be talking about. Conservation is actually the profession devoted to the preservation of, it says here, cultural property, but that could be uh, any historical, archaeological, or paleontological resource. Uh, preservation itself, so that's the protection of any of these kind of objects through activities that minimize chemical and physical deterioration and damage. Um, so we're going to be talking about these in the context of, of preparation as well and this is what uh, a lot of people do here at the museum, our technicians. So uh, on the AMNH American Museum Paleo Portal website, we define this as the removal of rocky matrix in which fossils are embedded and the subsequent stabilization of the exposed specimen to enable study or exhibit. Uh, so this doesn't really talk about um, the actual conservation process and, and the kind of things that we do after things are prepared. And I just want to stress that even though this is saying you're basically just removing a fossil to be used in research, uh, a lot of people do do this with, with the, the uh, stability and the future considerations for the fossil in mind. So people are thinking about preserving them, but not necessarily by applying principles of conservation that people might not necessarily know about. And this is because this is something that's, that's really just uh, starting to happen now. Uh, so preventive conservation, as I said, this is the kind of thing that we do to avoid damage occurring in the first place. Interventive conservation is when you want to apply some kind of a treatment. This can be to stabilize fossils or to do some kind of restoration work. Uh, so this would include um, reconstructing it to what it would look like in, in, in life if you don't have the entire fossil present. So 
why do we want to preserve collections in the first place? Well, every museum needs a collection, right? We can't do research, we can't have exhibits, we can't educate people about the history of life on Earth without paleontological collections. And obviously, we want to continue to do these things uh, for the foreseeable future. So we want these collections to last so that this can continue. And how do we make them last? So this is where conservation comes in. But you might say, hang on a second, aren't fossils basically just big old lumps of rock? Um, and this is kind of the case with, you know, your typical dinosaur fossil. It is permineralized, it is made of minerals now, it is a rock. Um, but there are other kinds of fossils too. You can have carbonized fossils, you can have uh, soft tissue impressions, and they can be incredibly easy to, to damage and obliterate. Even if you get just a bit of water on them, they can completely disappear. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have very small, delicate fossils, things like tiny fish. You breathe on them and they disappear and then you have a huge panic attack. Um, <laughs> but even, you know, the large fossils, if you look closely at them, they're not as solid as you might think. Um, you know, rock is always thought of as kind of a, a metaphor for something very permanent, you know, solid as a rock. But if you look closely at them, there's usually many, many cracks in it and little tiny micro fractures that you might not even be able to see. So, obviously, they're not as unstable as many other kinds of museum objects. So, you know, things like metal objects, they're going to corrode. Uh, fabrics are going to fade over time. Or taxidermy specimens uh, tend to get eaten by pests, which is really bad. Um, and they're not going to be as susceptible to de deterioration as many of these kinds of objects are. But that doesn't mean that they don't need looking after. Uh, and just as an aside, three of these objects are from a series called a History of the World in 100 Objects by the British Museum. It's really cool if you want to check it out. It's on their website. So the kinds of things that actually affect fossils, there are very, there's actually quite a few agents of deterioration, so things that actually cause damage to occur. I'm only going to talk about a few here, but there's a long list that you could go into. Um, so a big one is improper storage. So this is things like if you put fossils in cabinets, like in this picture here, and they're on top of each other, um, every time that cabinet is opened and closed, they're going to bump against each other. Bits are going to fall off. That's just not a good thing to do. Uh, also, sometimes if you put a large fossil just flat on a pallet for storage, uh, it may have all of the weight of that fossil on just a couple of points. And this means that over time and with gravity acting on it, it's going to break under its own weight. And uh, this is basically what happens there. Uh, handling, it's kind of one of those things that you have to do, like, to do research, you need to look at things, you need to pick them up sometimes. And uh, this obviously adds a lot more stresses to, to fossils that they're not usually exerted to, and this can cause a lot of damage too. Uh, vandalism, this is something that's kind of an unfortunate reality for, for many, many things. People like to go and see nice things and take bits of it home, which, you know, they shouldn't do, but they do. Uh, environment, so even the kind of environment that fossils are stored in, can actually cause them to deteriorate. Uh, especially there's a specific thing called pyrite disease, which this is actually a really dreadful picture of it in, in the corner here. This is from the Amonate Paleo portal as well. Uh, this is basically when there's pyrite present in a fossil, and that pyrite reacts to oxygen uh, in a high humidity conditions, and that causes crystals to grow, basically. And it causes blooms on the outside of the, the fossils. And uh, a lot of people try to you know, fix this by saying, oh, okay, We'll just put something on top of the fossil to prevent it reacting with the oxygen, which unfortunately didn't really work and uh, resulted in lots of fossils actually exploding. So that's no good. Um, also, the kinds of materials that we do use for treatments on fossils can actually cause them to degrade too. You have to think about what kind of things you're going to be putting onto a fossil. Uh, certain glues may shrink and pull away the surface or the, may release uh, some kinds of gases that are are no good either, and that's a sign of them deteriorating. Uh, sometimes things happen in collections that we don't really know why it's happening, why things are going on. This is something that we've called blue bone. So basically, for some reason, this kind of blue discoloration has appeared. They weren't like this when they were collected. We're not really sure why this is happening. Um, some samples were sent off about 20 years ago, actually, to the Canadian Conservation Institute, but they couldn't find anything. They couldn't figure out what was going on with that. Um, we just sent some samples back last year to see if they can do anything with their, their much newer techniques that they have now, but we haven't heard back from them yet, so 
Hopefully that's something we'll figure out pretty soon. Um, but for all of these kind of agents of deterioration, there are things you can do uh, to prevent damage from happening. Uh, so in the case of improper storage, it's as simple as basically providing a support for, for the fossils. So this could be uh, a support jacket, like for this displetosaur. It's a lovely support jacket. Uh, or just putting them in a box with ethophone, preventing them from rocking around. Uh, and you can display fossils still <coughs> um, just by providing some kind of support. This is a, a really cool metal support that we have in our galleries here. And things like arranging cabinets properly. So, you know, don't put fossils on top of each other. Don't put things into drawers that are going to scrape against the drawer above them. It's just a lot of common sense. Uh, and then handling practices. So again, common sense kind of stuff. If you're going to pick something up, pick it up with two hands. Uh, don't walk around backwards with it. You're going to trip over, that kind of thing. Vandalism, again, something that's easily prevented uh, just by putting a barrier in front of things. <clears throat> so especially for things that are on exhibit, put them in a display case. Uh, and you can provide extra security. So we're lucky here that we have a swipe card system, so not anybody can get into collections. You have to be a certain person with access to them. Also, the environment. You can control the environment that a fossil is stored in. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do this, ranging from having a complete HVAC system, which is very expensive, um, to just even using dehumidifiers or just trying to keep everything at a stable temperature and humidity. Um, the guidelines recommended for this are actually pretty, pretty constrained. So the temperature is supposed to be between about 59 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. No idea what that is in Celsius. Uh, and a relative humidity, actually, it's not supposed to really go more than 10% either direction from 45 and 55% humidity. And this is from something called the, the National Park Service Handbook. That's something they have in the US. And uh, Appendix U in there is actually completely dedicated to sort of the guidelines for, for storing paleontological collections and how you should handle them. And that's uh, got a lot of conservation type stuff in it, which is a really good resource. Um, another thing you can do is actually to create microclimates. This is something you have to do in case of pyrite disease, which we're really lucky that we don't really have here. Um, so once that starts, you can't really stop it. So you need to put, basically the specimens have to be put into a display case or into some kind of cabinet, which is oxygen free, preferably, and uh, with an incredibly low humidity to try and stop it from happening any further. But yeah, once it starts, you can't stop it. So it's best to prevent it in the first place. So despite doing all of this kind of stuff, uh, all the kind of preventive things you can do to stop damage from happening, it's still going to happen. Um, you know, things like you have to handle specimens. Uh, occasionally, accidents happen, you know. So that's when you have to use interventive measures. Uh, so this mainly includes treatments that you need to use to uh, apply to, to stabilize fossils. Uh, and this could include adhesives, which is what we're going to focus on mainly today. Uh, so basically glues. Uh, consolidants, they're basically uh, really runny glues. You can use them to consolidate very crumbly fossils, uh, and it basically holds it together from the inside out. Um, fillers. So if something has a huge gap in it, you can't glue it together, you can use some kind of filler to give it some, some structural stability so you can have the whole thing together. Uh, there are some problems, however, with the materials that we, we use. Um, many of the things that we do use haven't really been extensively tested for use on fossils or even for any other kind of conservation work. So we don't really know how they're going to behave in the long term, what kind of things are going to happen. Um, <clears throat> you know, are we going to put some glue all over something? In 100 years, someone's going to be cursing us because it's completely damaged the fossil. And <clears throat> most of the knowledge that we actually do have about any of the adhesive properties or consolidants or anything is taken from work in other fields. So there isn't actually a lot of literature uh, available for conservation in regards to paleontology or even a whole bunch of preparation techniques and that kind of thing. Um, and this actually, this was very apparent at, we went to a conference in October, a CCI conference, uh, people there from all over the world presenting all of their research on conservation. 
Uh, Brandon and I were the only people presenting a paleontological poster. So it's really something that people don't, don't really work in. <clears throat> and I think this is, you know, the reason that we don't really see anything is because applying conservation principles to paleontology is really a very new thing. Um, and this is partly because some of these concepts, like preventive conservation, are really very new in themselves. And uh, there's also always been that, uh, maybe that sort of perception that because fossils are such stable objects uh, that we don't really need to, to think about what we put on them. But really we do. And people are starting to think about this and, and to do research into it, which is really good. So the kind of research we're doing involved uh, te tensile testing of some of the adhesives that we do use in our lab. Uh, and by tensile testing, I mean we basically had to, uh, we made some samples and we had to pull them apart. So tensile forces is when uh, you have forces pulling on something. Uh, so that's purely a pulling force, not any sort of sliding or bending force is happening there. And something you have to consider whenever you think about using an adhesive, uh, you can't just grab the nearest thing that's on a shelf and put it on a fossil and hope for the best, really. You have to think about lots of different things. Um, probably the least important would be workability. So this is pretty much how easy the, the glue is to use. Uh, can you just chuck it on there and it, it sets right away? That's always nice. Does it take a really long time? Is it kind of finicky? Uh, and I always uh, throw in sort of how user-friendly it is with, with this as well. So is it something that's going to be irritating to your lungs? Do you not really want to work with it? Is it kind of a nasty chemical? Uh, reversibility, this is a really important one. So this is basically, once you stick something together, can you undo it again? Uh, and you might say, well, why do you want to do that anyway, right? We want to stick two bits of fossil together, da-da, it's finished. Um, well, you know, sometimes you do make mistakes. It might not fit together perfectly the first time. If the glue that you used is irreversible, you can't fix that mistake without causing more damage to the fossil. Um, <clears throat> another thing as well, uh, no glue is going to last forever. So even if it lasts a super long time, eventually you're going to have to take it off the fossil. Um, so if it's an irreversible glue, this is going to be still really hard to do. Chemical stability. So you also want to think about how long is this glue going to last? Is it going to deteriorate and fall apart within a few years? Uh, is it going to last a really long time? Uh, and lastly, strength. So obviously you want to know if your glue is actually going to hold the fossil together. And this is the kind of thing that we're focusing on in our research. And just as a quick aside in regards to chemical stability, there's another really cool research, uh, an adhesives and consolidants for paleontological conservation. It was produced by spinach. Um, and this basically says that all of these glues are not recommended for use in paleontology. Many of them have been used in the past, um, but for various reasons, they just don't last very well. They cause damage. They shouldn't be used. And pretty much any glue that you find, you know, on the shelf in the hardware store, is not going to be suitable for use on fossils. So getting back to our research, um, the question that we had in mind that we really wanted to find an answer to is, is this particular glue, Paraloid B72, strong enough for use as a fossil adhesive? And the reason that this was really a question uh, is because, well, the way that we make this glue is by taking these little beads, these are polymer beads, basically plastic, and you dissolve it in acetone to make the glue. But the way that it sets is that by, the acetone has to evaporate from the glue, just leaving the plastic behind. And sometimes this can take a really long time. So your bond is still going to be very flexible for sometimes even a couple of days. So then you start thinking, you know, is this going to hold? Do I want to use this kind of glue when I could use <clears throat> something else which is going to set immediately and I already can handle it, I can pick it up? So we thought, OK. We'll, uh, we'll see what, if we can get some numbers, like what's the deal with this? So the first thing to do is to go to the literature. Uh, there was a couple of studies that were relevant. So this one by Kube in 1986. Basically, he took some pennies and he glued them together with a tiny little bit of B72. And he hung weights on them. Uh, and he just kept adding weight until it broke. So that's how he measured how much uh, tensile force you could put on that. Um, and he did this on such a small scale, though, that it was really hard to sort of apply it to, to a lot of the things that we do. But he did find 
that after 24 hours, uh, the bond was really quite weak. But after 72 hours, it increased significantly, like almost 100 times stronger in some cases. Um, and then this more recent study by Podney et al. So they went a little bit more technical. They actually took uh, marble cores and glued them together and uh, used a universal testing machine to tear them apart. So that gives you uh, a lot more accurate sort of measurements because you can do that digitally. Uh, the problem with this study was, though, they did several different adhesives, but the point at which they broke was basically the same because all of the samples broke in the marble before they actually broke at the adhesive joint. So all that's telling you is how strong the marble is. So we don't actually know how strong all of these adhesives were. Um, but 650 pounds per square inch was the number they got for paraloid, um, obviously, before the, the marble broke. So it was probably stronger than that in these tests. So for our purposes, we decided we'd do something similar to what Podney et al. did. So we wanted to use one of those universal testing machines. And we decided to test our Paraloid B72. Uh, this is a 50% solution, so uh, basically the uh, same parts of Paraloid to acetone. Um, and we decided to test it against two other adhesives that we do use in the lab. Uh, this one is Paleobond PB100. That's a cyanoacrylate, which is basically a superglue. So that's a reaction adhesive. Uh, it basically works by um, reacting to moisture, and as soon as that happens, it sets right away. And DEVCON 2-ton epoxy. This is a two-part epoxy. You make, mix it together, and when the, the two parts come into contact, they start to set. So we really, it would have been ideal to use fossils, obviously, for this to see what kind of reactions happened. But unfortunately, uh, it's really hard to find hundreds and hundreds of little bits of fossil that are exactly the same, that aren't going to break when you put them in a tensile testing machine. So we had to use something else. So we decided on this limestone paving slab, um, mainly because there was lots of it, so we could make lots of samples. It was pretty uh, homogeneous, but it did have a little bit of internal structure, which is, you know, fossils have internal structure too. Um, so yeah, that was just something that we could, we could standardize really easily. Uh, so the basic concept between making these samples was stick a couple of bits of rock together, put some metal on the end, and put them in the machine, which I thought was like, oh, that's super easy, I can do that. Uh, but then I talked to the engineers at the University of Alberta, and they were actually like, okay, you have to have everything perfectly aligned. Uh, you know, if it's out of alignment, you're going to get slightly skewed results. It's not going to be purely tensile force acting on that. Uh, so then it became really complicated. It took us a super long time to make all of these. Uh, so basically what we did was we had 35 samples for each adhesive, but we glued them over different time periods. So some of them we glued three months before we did the testing, three weeks before we did the testing, and three days before we did the testing. So we ended up with about 300 samples. So I couldn't have done this without Tom. <laughs> Thank you for cutting all that rock. For the actual testing itself, so this is the machine that you put it in. This is the universal testing machine. You can see the sample here, uh, and you basically attach it to the machine using one of these metal grips, which the engineers very nicely made for me. Uh, and so how this works is basically it's a hydraulic system, and it, it pulls on the sample at a set rate. So it added 20 pounds of, of tensile stress every second. And then uh, it recorded basically uh, how long it took to break, um, and it sent all of that information and how, uh, how much stress was on the sample when it broke. And so I had that all in digital format, and I could put it right into Excel, which was really neat. So uh, these are the numbers that we got. So you can kind of see uh, Paraloid B72 was the weakest of the three. Uh, Paleobond was intermediate, and DevCon was the strongest. Uh, you'll also notice that DEVCON 2 ton epoxy was actually fairly consistent, so always around sort of seven, eight hundred pounds per square inch. Um, Paraloid and Paleobond both had a big jump after the three weeks, so when they'd had three weeks to set, they were apparently much stronger. But uh, the ones that were glued three months before we tested them were actually weaker than the ones at three weeks, so this is something that I'm going to talk about. So this is what the data looked like. Each of these little blue dots is one of the samples that we broke. Uh, and you can see the pounds per square inch of force 
on the sides here. So you can see it's actually, there's quite a large spread of data for each one of these, but the paraloid was generally between sort of 200, 600 pounds per square inch. Paleobond was between about 400 and 800 pounds per square inch. And the DEVCON 2 ton was between 600 and 1,000. Uh, but what you'll also notice about the DEVCON is that there's all these little red dots too. And each of these represents a sample that broke in the limestone rather than at the adhesive join. Uh, and the fact that you can see so many of these means that the, the epoxy and the limestone were both breaking at about the same tensile force. So what this means is that in this situation, you wouldn't want to use epoxy to glue this particular material because it's as strong or stronger than the material itself. Uh, and this is one of those principles of, of conservation that when you, you glue something together, if that join is stronger than the surrounding material, whenever any stress is put onto that specimen, it's going to break somewhere else. So you'd rather it broke in the same place than actually create more and more and more breaks in the specimen. Uh, so after we got all those numbers, we had to do some statistics. Uh, all I'm going to say about these uh, is basically, so this is each time, time period that we did, three days, three weeks, and three months. And these are the three adhesives. Uh, and you can see the pattern is actually the same for each, each time period here. So there's always uh, a significant difference between the strength of uh, these adhesives. And it's consistent across all three time periods. Uh, for each individual glue, though, so we had to do some pairwise comparison. That didn't work very well, did it? Oh, sorry. Um, we did some pairwise comparisons anyway to see what the difference was between each, uh, each sample group. And we found that this first jump, so that big jump that we saw in those numbers, it was uh, considered a significant difference uh, in, in strength. So what that means is that basically we did these tests and we found out that 95% uh, of the time it's going to be significantly stronger. It's going to be much stronger than, than at three days. Uh, and what this tells us is that something is, is happening here to make it, make it stronger. And this is kind of what I expected for the paraloid because, as I said, with, with the solvent evaporating, uh, after three days, there's still a lot of solvent left in that adhesive. And we could kind of see that when the samples were being torn apart, they almost sort of peeled apart rather than snap. Whereas after three weeks, uh, there was a very audible pop whenever they broke. So it seems that they weren't as flexible. There wasn't as much uh, acetone left in that glue. Uh, but then we do see that that drop happen. Um, this is not a significant drop in, well, not a significant drop from three weeks and not a significant increase from three months. Um, and the paleo bond, we saw the same pattern. So there was a significant increase in strength and then not really, we don't really know what's going on here. I'll talk about it in a minute, don't worry. Uh, this was kind of unexpected. I wasn't really thinking that the paleo bond was going to get a lot stronger after three weeks because you don't have to worry about the acetone evaporating. Um, could be because it, it maybe it wasn't quite set after three days. Maybe those bonds are still forming, even though it's already a fairly strong join. And with a two-ton epoxy, actually pretty consistent. Um, so basically the same every time. There is a little bit of a drop again after the three months. And uh, there's pretty much two possible reasons for this. So either the glues are actually deteriorating, they're not as strong after three months, or uh, there was some error in sample preparation, which is a possibility. Um, obviously, the three-month ones I did before the three-week ones, and the three-month ones, I didn't have Tom to help me. <laughs> um, but, you know, we sort of refined the technique a lot more after three weeks. I think they were much better lined up. Um, the only real way to find out what happened here is either to do it again or to continue doing tests uh, maybe, you know, six months or a year or some other time period. And uh, if those numbers were the same as three weeks, I could say, oh, yeah, this was sample preparation error. And if there's a, a continuing decline, then I can say the glues are deteriorating. So that's something we have to look at in the future. Uh, this is what the samples look like after they were broken. <clears throat> so you can see how much damage has been done to the surface here. When, when we first glued them together, these were completely smooth. And you can see there's lots of little bumps going on here. So that's where the surface has been torn away by the adhesive. Uh, and this it happened with all of the adhesives, but obviously the stronger the adhesive, the more damage was done to the surface. And uh, so the least damage was done by, by paraloid because it was the weakest of the three adhesives. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, so kind of a summary of the, the tensile testing we did. We did find that B72 was much weaker than paleobond, which was much weaker than two-ton epoxy. <clears throat> but we did also find that the two-ton epoxy is way too strong for this limestone. It's probably going to be too strong for fossils too. Uh, fossils, probably m many of them are not going to be as strong as the limestone material was. Uh, as I said, they're usually heavily fractured too, so they're easy to break. Uh, the results that we got were a lot lower than the ones that Podney et al. got in their study. So you remember they had about 650 pounds per square inch uh, for their adhesives. There's many possible reasons for this. Um, lots of differences in the studies. So for one thing, they were using a different kind of, of substrate. They were using marble. We were using limestone, um, different porosity, different chemicals in it. Um, also, you know, maybe we use a different amount of adhesive. So if their bond was thicker or thinner, that could affect it. Uh, the machine they were using might have been pulling the samples at a different rate than ours was. There's like a million different reasons that could have been different. And if anything, that just sort of represents the fact that when you use any glue, it's going to react differently depending on what you're gluing together. It's going to vary uh, depending on the kind of fossils. It's going to vary depending on the environment that you're gluing it in. Uh, there's lots of different variables. Um, <clears throat> but although B72 was the weakest of all the adhesives, it's still 350 pounds per square inch. Like, that's pretty good. And if you're using all of these sort of preventive measures that we talked about, if we're having supports for all of these fossils and you're not, you know, throwing them around, um, that should be fine. Like, there's not really going to be that much stress put on it if it's, it's, if it's stored properly. Um, <clears throat> so then just some of those other considerations that you have to think about when you're choosing your adhesive. So in terms of reversibility, paraloid is actually much more easily reversible than paleobond or two-ton epoxy. Two tons almost impossible to get off. Uh, and long-term stability. Paraloid is one of the most well-tested products that, that you can find in conservation. Uh, and basically everyone agrees that you know, it ages really well. You don't have to worry about it deteriorating. Cyanoacrylates, though, like paleobond, they're not really well tested at all, so we don't really know uh, how they're going to react, what, what we can expect from them, um, except from this one study, which was done on fossil material, and, and that showed that they do degrade in alkaline conditions. So if you're gluing together alkaline fossils, you can expect cyanoacrylates to degrade over time. Uh, and epoxies, they, they do yellow and... Um, become unstable even in dark conditions. Uh, it does take a very long time. Uh, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of years, but eventually they will deteriorate. So future work relating to this, we could do more of those tensile tests to see what was going on with those funny results there. So hopefully uh, we'll do some either over long time periods or we'll redo those tests. There's obviously other forces that act on fossils. It's not just tension. Uh, you have shear forces working on them. And there's also probably the most relevant kind of test uh, to our situation would be three-point bending tests. So that's pretty much you have the, the specimen uh, supported on either end, and then you push down on the join. So that would kind of be uh, applicable to, you know, if you have a fossil on a shelf, it's supported on two ends, and gravity is acting on that join. And that's the situation that we probably encounter most. <clears throat> um, we could evaluate more adhesives. We only chose three to start with because, obviously, we needed big sample sizes. Uh, it would have been a really long time to, to do more adhesives, but that's something we could consider. Uh, different concentrations of B72. Um, I was talking to Stephen Koob, who did that study, the original one, in 1986. And he was saying that he doesn't use 50% solutions anymore. He actually uses uh, 30 40%. So maybe we don't need to use a, a, a stronger solution of, of B72 as we are. Something to test, anyway. Um, and also, the only thing about these tests is that, obviously, you're not usually going to be in a situation where that kind of force is going to be exerted onto a fossil. You're not usually going to go up to it and start pulling it apart. Um, so it'd be more realistic to be able to do something that, you know, spans decades and you actually leave it and, and see what happens. But, you know, who knows where we're going to be in 20 years' time. So it's not the most practical of tests to be able to do. Uh, so really, from this whole presentation, uh, what you should take away from it is that P72 
Paleontological collections do need care too. Uh, they're not just big lumps of rock that can just sit there and they'll you know, be okay. Um, we should all be thinking critically about how to preserve fossils for the long term. And this doesn't just apply to preparators and people in collections. Basically, everybody who works with fossils, you know, if you have to handle them, if you have to do, put them on display, if you're using them for education, uh, think about what you're doing and how that's going to affect the specimen in the long term. Um, <clears throat> from our research, I would say that B72 can be used as an adhesive in many situations. Uh, and then it can be a good alternative to some of the other adhesives that, that may be irreversible or don't have as favorable uh, conservation properties. Um, and also, more research needs to be done. Uh, this is something that's really just taking off, um, something that people are just learning about. And uh, yeah, hopefully lots more happens. And these are the resources that I've been referencing. Uh, really good resources if you have time to check them out. And they're all available online. So yeah, thank you to all these people for being incredibly helpful and supportive. And that's about it. <laughs>